thank you so much, Sabrina and, and David and Alison for coming. And uh, appreciate all the the music, Eva. You always put so much love and energy into it. And our musicians and just everyone who helps out every Sabbath. It, it's just such a team effort, and it's a beautiful thing to see it. Our, our IT team, George, is always doing about 18 things back there, and he also did Children's Story today, so... <laughs> Uh, appreciate you guys back there so much. Um, would you bow your heads and uh, pray with me? God in heaven, uh, we have been in your presence here from the moment we came in, and we have felt your spirit as we have uh, worshipped, as we have sung, as we've listened, as we've given our offerings, as we have prayed, Lord, and uh, now we just turn our attention fully to you right now. We pray that your spirit would be uplifted in this place, that distractions would be removed, and that your voice would be heard and hearts would be blessed. So God, we just ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If we have um, learned anything over the last year, I, I hope one of the lessons that we've learned is that we need to seek the Lord. I don't know if you know this. I, I didn't know it. The phrase, seek the Lord, is repeated over 600 times in the writings of Ellen White, in the published writings of Ellen White. Now, of course, some of those are duplicates because she sometimes duplicated her own writings and then compilations and things came out like that. But 600 times, you'd, that, you'd think to, that that's kind of a priority then uh, for, for our church and for our people since, uh, since Spirit of Prophecy references it that much. In the Bible, there's more than a hundred verses that give that idea of either seek or search for the Lord or to, uh, you know, long for his righteousness or desire his justice, something along those lines. More than a hundred places uh, in scripture will you find that sentiment shared that we need to seek the Lord. And within that whole idea is the concept that there's a journey involved. You know, the Bible says that God is not far away from any of us. He's not hard to find, okay? And yet, all the more, we should not grow satisfied with a comfort level that God is uh, somehow easily uh, uh, addressed. It's still a journey for us on a daily basis to step in the direction of the Lord and to seek Him, to seek Him. There's a, uh, uh, an effort that's involved there. And so I'm going to talk with you just very, very simply and, and uh, uh, in a way that I hope that we can all understand and benefit from about this concept of seeking the Lord. So for my kids quiz today, it's going to be along these lines of seeking and searching. So any of the young people, if you just raise your hand, I'd love to have your, uh, your comments and your help as we go through this opening part of the message interacting with the kids. What was the merchant seeking in Jesus's parable Jesus told a lot of parables, and when he talks about a merchant seeking something, was it the pearl of great price or great value, the holy grail maybe, the fountain of youth, or the ruby of red value? Any of you kids know? Gloria, good to see you. Glad you're here today. What do you have to say for us? It was not the holy grail. Yeah, that's a different, uh, different thing altogether, but... I, I'm glad that you uh, gave it a try. All right, I see you back there, Jake. Yeah, that's right. The merchant in this parable is seeking for that pearl of great price. And when he finds it, he's willing to sell everything in order to acquire that pearl of great price. And of course, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven can be paired to a merchant seeking fine pearls. And when he finds the pearl of great price, he sells all that he owns in order that he may purchase. So in other words, heaven is worth and, and, and the relationship with God is worth everything we have. So um, th thank you. Thank you, Jake. Number two, who were the wise men seeking when they came to Jerusalem? They also came seeking someone. Was it John the Baptist, the high priest? The king of the Jews or the prophet Elijah? I saw Ketsia's hand just shoot up. So, Ketsia, what would you say? Yeah, that's right. And that's what they say. She said the king of the Jews, if you uh, weren't able to hear her voice. And so the wise men come and say, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And the very next verse says, then Herod, the king, 
<laughs> so it was obviously uh, Matthew's way of saying that kind of offended him a little bit. They were looking for Jesus. They were looking for the, the prophesied birth of the king of the Jews. So they were on their own journey to find Jesus. Number three, what was Abraham sinking when he came into the land of Canaan? So go back into your Old Testament memories when uh, Abraham is called out of the city of Ur. Was he looking for good pasture land for his herds or wealthy cities he could trade with, beautiful women to marry, or to be an ambassador of God to the people who needed him? Okay, Ryan, <laughs> what'd you say? One, number one, good pasture land for his herds. Well, he did find that, but that wasn't the ultimate goal. Any other guesses? All right, we're going to come to Gloria here. To be an ambassador of God to people. And what is an ambassador? A representative. Yeah, I actually looked for synonyms, and they're still like emissary, you know, and envoy and things like that. So I couldn't come up with a better word. But you got it. Yeah, that's someone who represents the Lord. That's what he was going to do when he came into Canaan. That's what Genesis uh, says, that all the families of the earth would be blessed uh, because of uh, Abraham seeking out that new country. Number four, what should we not seek because this belongs to the Lord? What should we not seek? Because this belongs to the Lord. Is it the Ark of the Covenant, vengeance or revenge, knowledge of the future, or a secret passage to heaven? Okay, I'm going to come over here to Anna. What did you say? Number two, vengeance or revenge. Was that what you were going to say too, Leah? Yeah. Um, I had to make sure that was Leah. Okay, <laughs> you're over here. Good. Yes, that is right. We're not to seek vengeance. We're not to take revenge. We're not to do evil to those who do evil to us. We're not to exact our own punishment or to allow the Lord to have his will because the Bible says that vengeance belongs to the Lord. And um, so we need to remember that. I am an unskilled PowerPoint uh, operator. It's always something. If you guys have any hints for me, was that me or you? Okay. Last question. What was Jesus seeking when he came to our planet? Let's see if any of the others who haven't answered yet would like to help. And Ketsia, raising your brother's hand does not count, but that's a good sisterly effort. I appreciate that. All right, I'm keeping an eye out. I'm going to give, can I give Ryan a chance this time? Ryan, what do you say? He was seeking souls. Seeking other people to help spread the ministry of God. Yeah, that, I think that works. Uh, Gloria, you want to augment that a little bit? He came to earth to forgive us of our sins and help others learn about God. Did I catch that? All right, now, Ketsia, last one here. Say it loud so we can hear you, though. To share the love of God, put very simply, right? And I think we get to answer this question in one word, right? He came here for you. He came there for all of us, right, for the world, for God so loved the world, right? So he came here for all of us, but we can personalize it. He came here for me, and he came here for you. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what he says in the, in the Gospel of Luke. That's what his mission was. That's his own little mission statement there. He came to seek you, and in return, he asked that we seek him. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about uh, this concept before, but every single one of us today are seeking something. Every single one of us, you are seeking something. You are, it's part of the human condition, all right, that we, we live in a constant state of need or desire or want or or a recognition that there is a preferable or better circumstance that we should be pursuing. All of us are. 
And each of us try to fill that natural desire in different ways. And the world offers a multiplicity of options to fulfill that inward desire that we have. Most of the great stories, most of the great uh, pieces of literature and poetry and song, all are about this concept of humans seeking something. Okay, sometimes it's just seeking love, seeking relationships, all right, seeking to establish a family, all right, and a lot of songs and, and poems are all, all about that. But if you go into like uh, old history and even in mythology, you have some of the great stories like Arthur, King Arthur, seeking the Holy Grail, right? Or, and then you have other stories of, of history that gets mis- mixed with mythology, like when uh, Ponce de Leon sought the Fountain of Youth in Florida, Right? He thought he could find a way to cheat death. If I could just find that sacred waters, if I could just find the fountain of youth, I could live forever. Sir Walter Raleigh thought he could find El Dorado. He thought, if I could just find that city of gold, man, I would be wealthy forever, and I would have riches, I would have power, and I would have glory. And most of the period of the great exploration uh, has all of Europe pouring out, searching for something, searching for the Northwest Passage, searching for adventure. Everyone is on a search for something. In this last year, our world has been searching. We've been searching for how do we navigate to get through this virus? How do we navigate our church? How do we navigate our business? How do we get to the next place where we can be successful with our schools or with our families. Everyone is on their own journey. Everyone is seeking something. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, 600 times, more than 600 times, the servant of the Lord counsels the Seventh-day Adventist believers to seek the Lord. And so what I'm going to do with you simply this morning or this afternoon is I just want to go through a few Bible verses that talk about this concept of seeking the Lord and allow the scriptures to speak to us today because I think this is something that we can hear and we can see and we can all say in, in some uh, level of agreement, yes, I understand that I need to seek the Lord, but let us look at what the Bible says and how it illustrates it through a variety of scriptures. And by the way, it was hard to narrow down those hundred verses in the Bible that talk about seeking the Lord to just a few to highlight today. So I hope that these will be a blessing to you. I start, and they, they go in the order of uh, the, the books of the Bible. So the first one I came to was in Numbers chapter 10. And these are just one verse at a time. You can look them up or they'll be on the screen. Um, this is what it says. Thus they set out from the mount of the Lord three days journey, while the, with the ark of the covenant of the Lord journeying in front of them for the three days to seek out a resting place for them. Okay. So we know this story. It's the children of Israel. They're, they're out of Egypt. They've been at Sinai, and, and they have built the tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant is with them, and they are traveling. And it says that they are following what? They're following the Ark. What was the Ark? It was like the visible presence of God, you might say. All right, It was where his, his commandments were contained. It had the mercy seat. It was like the, the physical embodiment, you might say, of the presence or power of God. Now, I like how modern Bible translators have left this verse. What is seeking out a resting place? Are they or is the ark? What are they following? They're following the ark. And it was up to the bearers of the ark to allow the Holy Spirit to lead them to wherever they were going. That's at least one way that this verse can lead you to believe. It says, to seek out a resting place for them. Okay? Now this is the idea that that, that caught me with this verse. We need to be following the Lord to lead us to heaven because some of us are too anxious to get to heaven that we've lost sight of the Lord of heaven. Okay? Okay? We need to be following the Lord because he knows the safe paths. He knows the direction we're going to go. And and we need to, at times, remember that our ultimate goal as a church is to know Jesus Christ and to know his love and to know his plan. And as we follow him, as we seek him, he will guide us to the safe places. He will guide us to heaven in his own timing. And for them, it took a long time, didn't it? You know, it was an eight-day walk from Sinai to to southern parts of Judah, Judea. It was an eight-day walk. But how long did they wander in the wilderness? 
40 years, 40 years. It's actually kind of funny. They call it wandering. They were all the time with almost, almost within a stone's throw of the Jordan River. But they were led by God because God knew how to guide them in that experience. All right, if I preach on every verse, we'll be here all day. So let's come to the next one. Next one I came to is Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. You've probably uh, heard this before. I know for some people they tell me this is one of their favorite verses. But from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him. That's a beautiful promise, isn't it? If you seek him, you will find him. If you search for him with how much of your heart and with how much of your soul? All right. So is seeking the Lord a part-time business? All right. Is seeking the Lord like priority number three in your life? Are you going to find the Lord if seeking the Lord comes after other things that you'd rather do? Okay, this is another important concept. This is the primary work of the believer. Nothing should be secondary in our lives. Or, yeah, uh, excuse me, this should not be secondary in our lives. This should be the primary work, to seek the Lord, to know Him, to worship Him, to love Him, to understand Him, to invite Him into our hearts and into our homes. And one of the reasons why the church and the Christian family struggle so mightily these days is because we have put the Lord on the back burner of our lives. And we said, when I have time, when the game's over, when the business is over, all right? But the priority that we're given here is you will seek him and you will find him. You will find him if you give him your all and you remove everything else. If you search for him with all, all your heart and all your soul, you will find him. You will find him. I love this one from Ruth. And so I, I, I put this one in here too. Ruth, um, uh, Boaz is the one speaking in this uh, verse here. And Ruth is out gleaning in Boaz's fields. Okay, part of the Jewish law was you were not allowed to reap your entire field. You had to leave the edges. You had to leave certain portions so that the poor could come and take the gleanings of your field. And Boaz, as a good Jew, was leaving the edges of his field ungleaned. And so the poor people would come and, 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 and glean from the fields. And Ruth was one of those who would come and glean. And here she is a stranger in a strange land. She's a Moabite, right? She's not even a Jew. Uh, all right, she is in a, she's a stranger in a strange land. She told her mother-in-law, um, you know, uh, uh, where you go, I go. Where you lodge, I'll lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I there too will also die. And here she is, a poor uh, uh, widow uh, in, in, a, in, in a land. And here she comes to the wealthy property of Boaz. And, and uh, you know the story. But Boaz says to her, in understanding the sacrifice she's made on behalf of Naomi, who Uh, Boaz was a kinsman too. May the Lord reward your work and may your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. You have given up all of your old gods. You've given up everything that was before and you've left your land. You've come here to seek the Lord. And because of that, your your work will be rewarded. Your work will be rewarded and your wages will be full. And here he's speaking to, again, someone who is, is um, in poverty, but recognizing that God will take care of you. God will take care of you. When you seek the Lord, when you make him your refuge, even a little becomes a lot. <clears throat> I wasn't sure if I could include this little thought here at some point, but um, I, I want to share this because it is talking about wages and, and, and the, the wealth of Boaz and things like that. Um, sometimes we seek things that don't satisfy. Um, sometimes when we get the things we seek, we realize that they weren't really what we wanted. Some of us try to fill our lives through seeking relationships that never work out. And yet when that relationship doesn't work out, we just try jumping to other relationships. Some of us think that uh, 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 wealth will bring uh, the satisfaction that we're looking for. Any of you ever actually kind of looked at the statistics of happiness among the wealthy? They're very low, all right? Wealth does not bring happiness. As a matter of fact, I, I read something and I forgot who said it, but it went something like this. If you want to bring misery uh, to those who hate you, wish upon them wealth, for their enemies will double, their friends will betray them, and they will be left alone with their money. 
Wealth does not bring satisfaction. Just ask Solomon, and uh, he tells us about that. But when you seek the Lord, your work is rewarded, and you will, uh, you will see the blessings of God. First Chronicles 22, 19. Uh, this is a little bit of a longer one. Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise, therefore, build the sanctuary of the Lord God so that you may bring the ark of the covenant into the, of the Lord and the holy vessels of God into the house that is to be built for the name of the Lord. There is a connection between seeking the Lord and being in the place where the Lord calls his sanctuary and being part of his sanctuary uh, service and experience. And I preached on that a couple weeks ago, and uh, I wanted to point that out. Into the house that is to be built for the name of the Lord. Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Should you just seek the Lord on Sabbath? Can you put off seeking the Lord Monday and Thursday, Wednesday, and say, I'll catch up with that, uh, that one day at the end of the week. I'll, I'll do it then. Does that work? No. Seeking the Lord should be a daily experience of our life. Seeking Him through prayer, through Bible study, through relationships, uh, with people that we love and seeing the handiwork of God. I don't remember how many of these I put. Probably about, I don't know, maybe 50 verses we'll go through today. No, I'm just kidding. But um, I, guess I'm, I guess we're done. Cause... All right, I put this one in. Uh, this is Rehoboam. This is the son of Solomon, Okay. The son of Solomon is being referred to here. And if you remember your Bible history, it was Rehoboam that led to the division of the kingdom of Israel. It was because of his lack of wisdom that the, uh, the, the, the Israel split into two countries. The ten tribes would go north into Israel and Judah uh, would stay uh, down in, in its own country and maintain Jerusalem in the south. But notice what it says here about Rehoboam. It says, he did evil because he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. Now, again, this is an interesting phrase. It can either be subjective or it can be objective. Did he do evil because he did not set his heart to seek the Lord? Or did he not seek his heart to seek, uh, to seek the Lord, therefore he did evil? Do, do you see the difference? I, I'm going to suggest to you that both are true. Both are true. He did evil. It was an evil thing for him to turn his back on God, right? And because he turned his back on God, he additionally could only see selfishness and sinfulness and evil. Does that make sense to you? So here's, a, here's just one idea for you to consider. Seeking the Lord is not a luxury to the Christian life. It's not only for the holiest of holies. It's not only for the extremely pious. In this context and in this verse, God warns us that if you reject the opportunity to make me a priority in your life, the only option is evil. That's what is left. Because I am the source of, of righteousness. I am the source of life. I am the source of everything that you need in your life. So if you cut me off or relegate me to some other level in your life, the only possible outcome is for the sinful aspects of your life to dominate you. He did evil because he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. This is not something that, you know, we should say, I'm going to work on this, and boy, by next year, I hope I've got it. No, it can start right now for us to seek the Lord. Psalm 34.10. This is, depending on the day you ask me, this is my favorite psalm, Psalm 34. Uh, but I shift. And, and again, there's just dozens of places in the psalms that has this concept. But here in Psalm 34, just one verse. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. And again, when I hear that, I just think, why would you not? When you understand what God is asking for us, why would you, why would the video games take the place? And by the way, I'm not anti-video games. I'm just using this as examples. All right? Why would you not want to make this a priority in your life to make God your first and foremost uh, relationship that you could be developing? 
because it's promised. Even the young lions, those healthy, vigorous lions that are just able to eat whenever they want, they will suffer, they will go through lack, they will hunger. But if you seek the Lord, you shall not be in lack of any good thing. It's a beautiful promise. Daniel chapter 9. If you remember, Daniel is reading the scriptures. He's wanting to understand prophecy. He's wanting to understand what God's plan is for the, Israel, uh, for the uh, Israelites in captivity in Babylon. All right, and in the beginning of one of the most beautiful prayers in the Bible, he says, so I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer. And again, I just want to emphasize what I said in the beginning. This whole idea of seeking him is so important to our understanding that this is not like uh, uh, just a, a, a simple uh, 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 thing where we just say, okay, Lord, here's my question. Now I want the answer right now. Okay? If you're seeking something, it means there's a journey involved, right? Do you get what I'm saying? This whole, uh, this whole imagery and the semantics of what it means to search, to seek, to wrestle, to desire, to long for, all right? It's something that should be more to us than just a simple, well, you know, I have this big, uh, important thing that I need to know from the Lord. So let me say a little prayer. Lord God, give me wisdom. I'm seeking you now. Hallelujah. Amen. And you go on your way. Is that seeking the Lord? Now that's a prayer, and prayers are precious, and prayers are powerful. But if that's the extent of your agony in the journey, if that's the extent of your seeking that's pretty limited. If your kids came to you and say, hey, dad, I'd love to have $100. Thank you very much. I expect it on my desk tomorrow. Appreciate it. See ya. And then they're going, wait, uh, tomorrow, dad, I told you I sought after it. Where's my $100? Right? But if they came to you and they poured out their hearts and say, you just don't understand. I will work for it. I will do what I can. But it's just so important to me. Let's talk about this. How can we meet in the middle? What can we do to work this out? And eventually, they'll get the idea. And they might get a few bucks. (laughs) We need to seek him. It needs to be a vigorous activity. Oh, wait, I wanted to say this. So here, as Daniel is trying to understand the will of God, he says he sought him by prayer, to seek him by prayer, with supplications and fasting, with sackcloth and ashes. What What would the Christian church be like today if more of God's people sought him in their posture, in their weekly behavior, and even their eating patterns. I'm setting aside these things that are pleasurable to me because I am in need of the presence of God in a powerful way. There's many, many lessons in these verses that we could look at. Into the New Testament, maybe one that you've thought of and uh, we're wondering if we would come to here. Of course, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, but seek Seek, what's the word I've underlined there? Seek first his kingdom. Seek first his kingdom and his life. They will be provided in ways that you won't always even understand. But if you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, then your heart is in position to understand and appreciate the good things that God wants to do in your life. But we have to seek him first. Just a couple more in our little Bible study this morning. Here in Colossians, Paul says, if you have been raised up with Christ, and he's talking about resurrection raised up in in a spiritual context. If you've died to self, if you've died to sin, if you've accepted the resurrected Christ as the power in your life that has resurrected you as well, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And this one is just important to my heart too, because sometimes, my friends, sometimes, my dear believers, we get the idea, I'm an Adventist, man. I know it. I got it. I mean, we got the Sabbath. We got the right deal about the state of the dead. We've got the health message. I mean, I'm ready to walk into heaven right now. Just open the door. Now you, I, I say it a bit, you know, facetiously, but that attitude is somewhat known amongst the brethren, friends. And here Paul is saying, 
I don't care about that. If you have been raised up with Christ, if you've received resurrection power, guess what? You get to keep seeking him. Because the power of our sinful nature is thus that if we do not die daily, that old self creeps up and then that sinful nature breaks into our lives and pretty soon we're used to it. We're used to it. Keep seeking the things above. I have not arrived to perfection yet. I know some of you think I have. I appreciate those sentiments. I know that I am a, an example of just beautiful Christian behavior at all times. I realize that. I have not been, made it there, guys. Ask my kids. <laughs> Ask my wife. I need to keep seeking the things above because there's so much more that God has in store for all of us, no matter how he has brought us in our journey. And this is the last one for us this morning. The last one, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Without faith, we're told, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe, must trust, must have faith that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. He is a rewarder of those who seek him. So I just have a simple question for you today. What are you seeking? What is your daily heartbeat and desire when it comes to your relationship with God? Do you have a regular experience with God every single day? I don't know how I would make it in this world today if I did not have the refuge of my relationship with Jesus. The life of a church depends Notice, the life of a church depends on the interest with which it manifests to those outside of the fold. Let the church of God remember that Christ gave himself as a sacrifice to save a world from destruction. For our sake, he became poor, that we might, through his poverty, come into possession of eternal riches. Shall those whom God has blessed with the knowledge of the truth become narrow in their plans? Let them arouse to a sense of their vast obligations, cutting away every thread, every thread of selfishness, that the Lord may pour upon them his Holy Spirit. Let them seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. They have no reason for being faithless and complaining. Let them cease all fault finding and murmuring and encourage a spirit of gratitude for past mercies and blessings. Let them praise the Lord in unfeigned gratitude for the light of his word reflected upon those in darkness. Thus, they will be prepared to work to the praise and glory of Christ and to inscribe upon their banners, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Signs of the Times, April 21st, 1901. Let's pray. God in heaven, Lord, I know that this is not an overly profound sentiment this morning. It's something that we have encountered so many times through uh, sermons and song and meditation and scripture about seeking you out, Father. But Lord, just in this small way, uh, I pray that this journey through the scriptures and these little elements of, of, uh, uh, of thinking about these verses, God, would be an opportunity for all of us to recommit our lives to seeking you first and foremost in, in everything that we do. Let nothing supplant our relationship with you. God, let no distraction, let no uh, selfishness or sinful tendency keep us away from knowing you as our God and Savior, because through that relationship, everything else is improved in our lives. Our knowledge, our love, our, our ability to endure, everything is improved because of you, Father. So God, may this church, may these witnesses, may everyone who's listening, whether here in this sanctuary or watching online, wherever they may be, may we all make this commitment to seek you first, in our lives. Thank you, Jesus, that we could be with you today. 
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you again next week, and hopefully it'll be just a little bit warmer.